Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for today's FameLab Cork Regional Heat. As you might know, FameLab is a global science communications competition run by ourselves and the British Council with our colleagues in Cheltenham Science Festival. And here in Ireland, we're so lucky to work with our partners, Science Foundation Ireland, CPL and Henkel. And especially in Cork, we're really fortunate to have great partnership with UCC and to our national media partner, News Talk. Thank you so much. If you're joining us as a competitor this evening, the very best of luck. And if you're joining us as a supporter and friend, I hope you're sending lots of virtual good luck vibes to our competitors. Now it's time to hand over to our host for the evening. Thanks so much. Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to FameLab, the Cork Eats 2021. I'm delighted to welcome you to our event tonight. My name is Emer Ferguson and I am your MC for the evening. So first and foremost, just to welcome you all uh, to this evening's event. As you all know, Sci um, FameLab is the largest and world's biggest science communication competition, running in over 30 countries all over the world and actually has been running in Ireland since 2013. And here we are in Cork, uh, the true republic or the, the true capital, as some of us call it. And actually, would you believe Cork heats have been running since 2013, the longest running of all of the Irish heats. We've had three winners so far, so you never know. Uh, tonight might be another night for our um, contestants as well for another winner from Cork. Sadly, it is the last year of Fame Lab. Um, so we're going to you know, go out with a bang and we're going to have a fantastic evening ahead of us. I'm delighted so many uh, participants are taking part in the competition this evening. We have 15 people uh, lined up and ready, waiting, waiting behind the scenes. Each contestant will give a talk for three minutes. And really what they're being judged on is the three C's. So that is content, clarity and charisma. So content means that it's scientifically relevant and scientifically correct. Clarity in that they can communicate to a non-scientist. So making sure that it is easily understood by a lay person or a general a member of the public and charisma, the most important one. So meaning, in other words, do we want to hear more? Have they given us enough scope to tell us that they want that we want to hear more? OK, they can't use PowerPoint presentations. I know. Very sad. And but they can use any visible props that will fit on the screen. Tonight, we're going to end up having two finalists who will go on then to represent Cork in the national heats. So with any good competition, we have to, of course, have three fantastic judges. So I'm going to introduce the judges to you now. So our first judge is Deirdre Robertson, and she's a senior research officer in the Behavioural Research Unit. She uses insights from psychology and behavioural economics to design experiments that can inform policy in multiple areas, including economic design and making, environmental behaviour and health. So a big wave from Deirdre. Our next person then is Joe Lyog, and Joe has worked in UCC or is working in UCC media and public relations since January 2020. His career prior to this was in journalism, most recently with the Irish Examiner, where he worked for over five years as well as a freelance contributor to the Irish Times, Irish Independent, and other media. So a big wave from Joe. And last but by no means least, we have Dr. Neil Kavanagh. Niamh is an award-winning science communicator and scientific consultant working with M Squared Lasers, a leading developer of photonics and quantum technology. As a passionate advocate for equity, diversity and inclusion in STEM, Dr. Kavanagh is the chair of the IEEE Photonics Society Diversity Oversight Committee and an OSA ambassador. So a big wave from Niamh. So then it leaves me to the next um, great part of my job, which is to introduce our speakers. So I am delighted to introduce our first speaker. So originally hailing from upstate New York, Katie Gazetta has spent a passion for exploring the microbial world within the gut. Katie's research at UCC focuses on understanding how these trillions of microorganisms influence the birth and survival of neurons in the brain. Her talk is entitled, Our Microbial Ecosystem, over to you, Katie. Did you know that only about 43% of your cells are human? You heard me, only 43% of your cells are human. Well, Katie, how could this be? I look human, I feel human. Well, your greater half is comprised of cells much smaller than human cells, and they're invisible to the human eye. 
Rightfully, these microscopic cells are called microbes and include species of bacteria, archaea, protists, and fungi. These microbes have made themselves at home, on and inside of your body. Take a look at your hands, for instance. Each square centimeter of your skin on your hands is home to about 1,500 bacterial cells. But please don't let these microbial beings scare you. Scientists are realizing every day that these bacteria and other microorganisms are very important for human health. For instance, let's take a look at another microbial community. Most microbes in your body live inside the warm, nutrient-rich ecosystems of your intestine. But they aren't just hitching a free ride. Your gut microbiota help your body digest food and release nutrients that your human cells simply cannot. In addition to helping your digestion, we now know that these gut microbes are important for educating the immune system and keeping your body healthy. This diverse community of microorganisms isn't in a constant state. Much like populations of plants and animals in a rainforest, the populations of microbes in your body are highly dynamic and respond to changes in the environment as well. General antibiotics, for instance, could be thought of as a forest fire, completely eliminating many bacteria inside of your gut. But these antibiotics may be really important when you've caught a bad bacteria that's making you sick. On the other side, a healthy, balanced diet rich with fiber and other nutrients help feed the beneficial bacteria and encourages them to grow. Well, why does this all matter? My research investigates how the bacteria that live in our gut affect our brain. Yes, our brain! The gut bacteria are not only important for digestion and educating the immune system, but also for helping your brain function properly. They can do this by producing different metabolites and sending signals directly to the neurons and other cells in your body that can carry messages around and up to your brain. In doing so, these bacteria in your gut can influence how neurons in your brain are born and grow and mature. This process of neurogenesis is disrupted in certain disease states and disorders such as depression or aging-related cognitive decline. Interestingly, the community of gut microbes are also impacted in these states. By studying this further, we're beginning to understand how we might be able to target the gut microbiota by diet or other interventions to improve our brain health. No, that's some food for thought. So what a great start. That really, really was such a cool talk. So well done to Katie. Um, an interesting topic, the microbiome, like it's all around us. And, and certainly I know for uh, pandemic times where we're more than aware of microbes, definitely they're, they're on the top of our priority list. So now it leads me to my first judge that I'm going to call upon, maybe to ask a few questions of Katie. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much for such a great talk, Katie. Um, it's a research area that is completely new to me. I have no idea what kind of instruments you use to look at the gut and the brain. Um, I'd love to know a bit more about that. That is a great question. Um, in my research, we have a few different methods for looking at how the gut bacteria influence the brain. Um, so first of all, you want to know what bacteria are there, right? So what we can do is we can do certain types of sequencing to look at the DNA, and we can relate that to some reference libraries and say, okay, these bacteria are the ones that are likely in this community. Now, there's so many bacteria that we don't really know yet. And so those libraries are um, growing every single day and there are what we know about the bacteria is only as good as those libraries. Beyond the microbiota, we can do a lot of different things to study the brain. Uh, we can look at certain behaviors um, in preclinical models. We can also go in and look at um, how the RNA expression is or um, whether certain proteins are being expressed differently in certain states where we've perturbed the gut microbiota. So those are the key tools, I suppose, uh, to keep it quite brief. Um, now, my research involves a bit more than that. So if you have any follow up questions, I'm welcome to hear them. No, that's super interesting. And hello to your cat as well. <laughs> fur babies are most welcome on FameLab. Absolutely most welcome. My little fur baby is currently running around the floor with a bone in her mouth and she's making circles. So apologies if you can hear her snorting in the background. 
So thank you so much, Neve. Thank you so much, Katie. I think that was absolutely amazing. What a start to the evening. Uh, we're going to dive straight into our next participant. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Melazine. So Melazine holds an MSc in electronics and PhD in electromagnets. As a senior postdoctoral researcher in Tyndall, she's now designing wireless implantable medical devices or WIMDs uh, for humans and animals. So over to Melazine Pujon with her talk, Smart Contact Lenses for Cows. Hi, I'm Mel, and this is Daisy, my little cat. We make a draw, I add to the speech, and she becomes a prop. Her and I are obviously very different, but we also have a lot in common. For example, we eat, we sleep, and when we are not okay, we need to go to the doctor or the veterinarian for her. The main difference is when I'm not okay, I'm able to speak, to express myself. But Daisy can't, and not only because she is a prop. Cows don't speak. The veterinarians and the farmer who are caring for Daisy would like to have something which tells them when Daisy is not okay. Something which could enable her F monitoring on a daily basis. They want something harmless for her, but also easy to use for them. Impossible? Not really. We already have this kind of devices for ourselves, for humans. I'm sure you are using thermometers, which are also used for animals. But what about smart devices like smartwatches? Smartwatches are placed on the wrists and provide health information like birth rate or saturation in oxygen. I wonder, have you heard about other smart devices like maybe smart contact lenses? This one is not well known. It is contact lenses which can provide elf information directly to a distance reader. For example, they have been studied for diabetic patients to provide directly the glucose level of the tear fluid. So why not applying that for cow? I know it sounds a bit crazy, but it is actually my job. I'm creating a contact lens for Daisy. This smart contact lens will provide health data directly from her eye to the smartphone of the farmer. The contact lens will integrate a sensor placed directly on the contact lens, sensing biomarkers, health biomarker in her teeth feed. Then the data from this sensor will be transmitted through antennas and electromagnetic, electromagnetic field directly to the farmer's smartphone. Funny enough, for that, I'm using another well-known technology, which is the same technology which is used for contact lens payment. It's called near field communication or NFC. What do you think, Daisy? I'm sure you didn't see that coming but it's the only way for me to keep an eye on you. Thank you. Love it, Mel. What a clever use of props. And we've, we've got to send a little bit of love to Daisy. Uh, I believe two days ago, it was even World Milk Day. She might be aware, you never know. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our judges now to come up with a few questions for Mel. I'm, I know she'll be delighted to answer them. Um, so I think who we'll go to is we'll go to Deirdre Robertson. Hi, Mel. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Hi. That was really interesting. Um, so my question is, you mentioned that the contact lens can pick up certain biomarkers in the eye. So can you tell us a bit more about what types of diseases or what types of biomarkers it can measure? And are there limits to these as well in the terms of the, the things that it can measure? Thank you for your question. So I will speak about biomarkers in the tear fluid only for the cow part. Um, it's quite similar for the human one, but uh, we will focus on the cow. Uh, so there are physical biomarkers and there are chemical biomarkers. So for example, one very useful biomarker is temperature. 
So we can actually have the temperature in the eye, which can indicate uh, infection, for example. Uh, we can also have the pulse rate in the eye um, and the pressure, which are all uh, indication uh, of health. And we can think about chemical biomarkers. And for a car, for example, if ever we can sense the calcium uh, level in the tear fluid, it will be very useful for uh, milk fever, actually. You know the cow, when they are calving, uh, they do have milk fever. And so indication of the level of calcium in the eye could help a lot. The limitation of what we can sense is basically what is available in the tear fluid as chemical and uh, physical um, aspects, but also what we can do as a sensor technology to be able to capture them. So I hope it answers your question. It does. Thank you very much. Brilliant. I think you did a fantastic job, Mel. Another fantastic, another fantastic um, contestant. So we're on to contestant number three, would you believe already? And this uh, gentleman is Owen. Oh, so Owen describes himself as a perpetual student. Um, in the last 10 years, he's earned a BSc in zoology, an MSc in animal behaviour, a higher diploma in food science, a certificate in agricultural management, I'm really out of breath. And now he's working at Thermo Fisher while pursuing an MSc in analytical chemistry. So without further ado, I'm handing you over to Owen Griffin and his talk is entitled Blue Veins of Gold. We are in blood, stepped in so far, should we wait no more, returning would be as tedious as go war. This is our blood. It is precious and it has innate protection. Medicines and devices that touch our blood can, boost, can bolster this protection, can provide us with a safety net against that which would seek to harm us. But these medicines, these devices must be tested. They must be safe. They must be free of all contaminant, any bacteria, before they can be injected into our veins. And for this certainty, a sacrifice is made. In the 1940s, the rabbit test was developed. Rabbits were injected with medicines designed for humans. If they developed a fever after three hours, it was shown that these medicines were unsafe. They were contaminated with bacteria. They should not be used, not be used on patients. But this is timely, this is costly, and is not as effective as it could be. So in the 1970s and 80s, another test was developed. Another sacrifice was made. This is the blue blood of the horseshoe crab. Now the blue blood of the horseshoe crab contains an agent in it which is specialised in detecting bacteria that could harm us, that if it got into our blood would cause fever. The test is very simple. You extract the agent from this blood, you mix it with the medicines. If the mixture clots, then it shows that medicine was unsafe. It could not be used. It should not be used on patients. The blood holds a coagulant, a collagenating factor that when in the presence of bacteria binds together, gels the blood, but it doesn't look for the bacteria. It looks for the toxins on the outside of the bacteria. It looks for the bull, not the horns. And it is so sensitive that it will find a picogram in a milliliter. That's one grain of sand in a 50 meter swimming pool. Alas, this blood is not free. It is not farmed, nor is it made. It is harvested from a creature in the ocean. It saves us on time. The gel clots instantaneously. No more three hour wait, but time waits for no man. In this era where disease and humans race to coexist, these creatures are sacrificed for our well-being. They are innocent and we use them as such. Will all great Neptune's oceans not wash this blood clean from our hands? Wow, 
wow, another powerful um, talk there by Owen. Really, really intrigued and definitely wanting us to, uh, leaving us with wanting to hear more. So now it brings me to our judges. Now, I've, I've no doubt there's going to be a few questions here. I'm going to hand over to Joe. Thanks, Will Nona. And it was really, um, really interesting presentation. I'm just wondering, uh, are you ultimately getting at that, that maybe we should be looking at other methods of, of doing testings other than, than annual testing? Is that kind of the, the purpose of, of your presentation? Is it something that we should be considering? Um, I think it's very topical. Um, in, I might shoot myself on the foot here, but I think in, in Europe, it's used. Uh, so there is a, an alternative to this test. So the two tests they use, it's pyrogen testing, you're testing for endotoxins. There's two tests used. You've got the rabbit fever test and they've got the LAL test, which is luminous uh, mucocyte lysate, which is what the extract from the blood is. Um, because of the pandemic we're in, we've killed more crabs in, the, in you know, re releasing them back to the environment. But there is an alternative there that is um, synthesized artificially. Um, and that's uh, developed by two companies, a, a Chinese company and a, and a German company. Um, and they allow it to be used in Europe, but not in America. The FDA have not approved it. So it's really something that if we want to continue with the times race that we're against in, in this and, and the next generation of, of diseases that we have to fight, we have to ensure that what we have is sterile, is pyrogen free going into our bloods. And we have already in existence something that can be used to uh to 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 ensure that that's artificially created that's created in a factory that doesn't harm any animals and um, so the quicker that that's approved that's proven to be as good if not better than the natural variant then uh, the sooner we don't have to harm these these uh, innocent creatures anymore okay thanks a million so we're going to dive on to our next participant, our next uh, fantastic speaker. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Alida. So Alida achieved a master's degree in clinical uh, forensics and sports chemistry at the University of Turin and is now a PhD, PhD student at Vistamilk SFI Research Centre, working with Nanotechnology Group at Tyndall National Institute. So Alida Russo, her talk is entitled, Why is Milk White? Over to you, Alida. Have you ever asked yourself a question about something that you can see every day? I'm pretty sure you're nodding at this moment, so just imagine something. It's one of those mornings you're waking up, you're still sleeping, and you go to the kitchen. There you want to have cereals and milk. While you're pouring your milk, you actually look at it and you ask yourself, why is milk white? So I'm very passionate about all food science and actually it turns out that I'm analyzing milk for my PhD. Well, that's actually another story. So we go back to milk. Milk is mainly composed of water, 87% of it. We have then fat, proteins, sugars, vitamins and minerals. Milk is considered a colloid. A colloid is when we have small particles of a substance into another substance. In this case, what particle do we have? So if we take a special magnifying glass, what we can see are some fat globules. These fat globules are spheres or droplets of different dimensions dispersed in the water. When we have a liquid dispersed into another liquid, we talk about an emulsion. So in this case, milk is an oil, the fat, in water emulsion. These fat globules have actually also a yellow hue, and this is due to the fact that the cows eat the grass, and from the grass they take beta carotene. Beta carotene is a pigment that we can find in a lot of vegetables, and for example, we can find it in carrots. And what happens is that if we freeze milk, we can actually see this yellow hue. So I did it for you, and you can see it's the yellow. And it's actually the same that happened for the cheese. In the cheese, you can see the yellow due to the fat. So what happens if we freeze the milk is that the water will create some ice crystals and the fat will be all concentrated. So the dairy product actually here in Ireland have a lot of this yellow shadow because uh, cows are mainly grass fed. So we continue to go inside the milk and what we'll see will be some proteins. These proteins are actually the main one is casein. This casein is organized into casein cells. 
is organized into this structure thanks to the presence of a calcium phosphate. And the presence of both case and cells and glo fat globules is actually the reason why milk is white. What happens is that the light eats the milk, it found all these particles, and these particles will really reflect all the wavelength of the light, all the colors of the light, in the same way. And we can see the white. At white, we can consider it like a special color that is doing to the blending of all the colors together. So, next time you're going to grab a glass of milk, just consider all this science. Wow, what an amazing talk. Well, well done, Alida. Um, milk, who knew? Such a cool topic. And again, like I say, I think Tuesday was World Milk Day. So yeah, it's celebration of milk and all things milk. The next time I pick up a glass of milk, I will certainly be contemplating all those different, uh, the different science going on there. Hey, Alida. Thank you so much for your talk. It's so interesting. Um, the, so other animals that don't eat grass, is their milk a different color? And if so, are there all sorts of colors of the rainbow <laughs> i'd love to find out more so uh yeah so about the other animals so if you consider for example goat's milk or uh, buffalo they are usually uh, more white like in the sense because we said that the cows as this yellow you kind of and that's related to the fact that even the, if they are grass-fed they metabolize the beta-carotene into uh, vitamin A, and the vitamin A is colorless. So we don't see that this yellow shadow. And uh, yeah, about all the rainbow, of course, all the we see all the colors of, and it depends on the different particles that we have also in the, in the atmosphere. And so how the lights will be uh, also scattered in this case. So yes. Super interesting. Thank you. Great talk. Great question, Niamh. I'm definitely intrigued about multicolored milk. That would be so cool. Uh, I would definitely buy that. Well done, Alida. Another fantastic talk. Well done. So on to our next contestant. So let's see, who do we have next? So Fernando is doing a PhD in nanotechnology group between Tyndall National Institute and CIT, where he's working on developing an immunosensor for the detection of plant diseases. His main objective to join Fame Lab was to show to everyone that even the most difficult topics can be easy to understand with humour. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk, Fernando. Fernando Diaz and his talk is entitled The Frozen Pandora's Box. Over to you. Have you ever heard of Pandora's Box? That box that you should never open because it contains all the chaos in the world? Well, just so you know, we have been opening it little by little for many years and we are close to releasing all the disasters in it. One of those disasters is epidemics. We have experienced the coronavirus crisis this past year, but in history there have been many epidemics. For example, in 1492, an expedition with 90 men from Spain traveled overseas for two months to land for the first time in America. It was an accident, but at least they arrived. And the thing is, like, this crew travel under very bad hygiene conditions, typical of the medieval society. Rats, lice, no sour at all, guys, and different typical diseases such as smallpox, typhus, or yellow fever. They had too much dirtiness attached to their bodies, especially when they in their clothes. Like, it's like if you were trying to remove the skin of a chocolate muffin. Despite washing them, the diseases they carry had a huge impact on the indigenous population. That makes sense because they collapsed, because they didn't have an immunosystem ready and adapted for those visitors. And you will say, okay, thank you for this story lesson, but what will the epidemics of the past have to do with us today? Well, now imagine your freezer, for example. Usually nobody cleans, right? And we don't even know what we have in there. But one day, you leave by accident the door of the freezer open and you find that the ice has melted and has been replaced by plastic, a crystal of some beer that you were forgetting there, and a brown sludge full of microorganisms. In some cases, especially if you are a student, there has to be more secrets than in the Lord's Major USB. And thanks to the climate change, 
the ice in different parts of the world, like for example Antarctica, are melting. That's why we are able to find the cadavers of different ice age animals, like for example mammoths, in perfect conditions. But that's not all we are finding. Lots of microorganisms that were trapped for centuries in the ice are starting to appear as well. For example, by 2016, the cadaver of a deer infected with anthrax appeared after 70 years, causing an outbreak of anthrax in Alaska. Can you imagine the amount of prehistoric microorganisms that could be there, ready to attack animals and plants, not just humans? So, what is the moral of this story? I think that is clear. We have to keep the freezer of the earth as close as we can, otherwise, what we will encounter are the diseases trapped in our frozen Pandora's box. Because guys, if you think that your freezer is bad, can you imagine what we have in the North Pole? Thank you. Wow, Fernando, you've just made me think I need to go clean my freezer. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant talk, really, really cool. Um, so excited to hear, you know, all the various things. And of course, he used a fantastic prop, which was a chocolate muffin, and now I'm really hungry too as well. So really hit all the boxes there. Brilliant, Fernando. So now I'm going to go over to our judges. So I think we'll go to Deirdre, I think. Hi, Fernando. Um, thank you for another fascinating talk and also very terrifying talk um, in a way. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question about science communication rather than the topic. So, you know, climate change is a problem that's increasing and a big problem is people not feeling it. So not realizing that climate change is something that might affect them. And the problem is that it might be too late before people do. So now that we've all experienced firsthand a pandemic like COVID-19, even though it maybe wasn't caused by uh, the problem you bring here, or maybe it was, do you think that these kind of stories and trying to link, you know, the idea of the pandemic and the idea of what will happen um, if the ice melts is a good way to communicate to people who might not be aware or feel that climate change is a big problem? Yeah, I think that this crisis that we had this last year is like a point of view that to see that we are vulnerable. So it's a way as well to to see how important are uh, our immune system at the moment, because a lot of people were is still thinking like, you know, we have the anti-mask, we have the anti-vaccine, we have a lot of things around there that is still um, avoiding what we have in here. But I think that this crisis is helping a lot to see what is around us. And the thing is like if, people start to think as well, because usually people think only in the climate change, but not all the effects that could be there, like for example, the microorganisms. So I think that if we start to focus as well in, let's say, scare a little bit the people in this in this way, like it's a good um, method to, to focus in, okay, guys, if we don't change what we are doing now, we will not have a happy ending. So... I think that is like a starting point, this crisis. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think all good science communication is the start of a conversation. So we've started the conversation there. That's a, a fantastic point, uh, Fernando. So I have the pleasure now of introducing Manazi. So Manazi is currently working as a research assistant at the APC Microbiome Ireland. During the course of, of his graduation or of the graduation in microbiology and post-graduation in virology, as well as health promotion at the University College Cork, uh, she developed a passion for communicating the unknown. So I'm delighted, I'm really excited to hear what Manazi and Ned Carney has to say about water, waste and WADI. Over to you. Imagine you're standing under the scorching sun of Egypt, waiting in line to see the pyramids of Giza. You're feeling very thirsty and all you want is the water from the fountain in front of you. But you've been warned that the local source of water might not be safe for drinking. So you reach inside your bag and out comes a bottle of Fanta. By now you might be feeling guilty about the fact that you're introducing high levels of sugar into your system and generating waste while doing so. 
But what would you say if I told you that there is a device that would make you feel a little less guilty about generating this waste and could simultaneously also provide a family in Africa with safe drinking water? Guess what? It's your lucky day. This device exists and it was created by a company called Helios. They named it the Water Disinfection Indicator or simply WADI. WADI is capable of measuring the ultraviolet radiations that fall on the device. Now, how does this help us? Let me tell you, UV radiation is nature's killer weapons. They are capable of destroying all the different bacteria that make water unsafe for drinking. So if Vadi was kept next to a bottle of water, then it would be capable of detecting and measuring the UV radiation that falls on this bottle. It would also indicate to us when the water is safe for drinking by displaying a smiley face. Vadi is a very small device and can be easily carried from one place to another. It is an eco-friendly device because it is solar powered and it utilizes the solar disinfection method, thus reducing the carbon dioxide emissions. Last but not least, it provides for a very scalable method because it, one Wadi device can be used with multiple water bottles and therefore provide large volumes of safe drinking water. Wait a minute, I just realized by now you might be wondering what happened to your bottle of Fanta? Well, you see. This bottle is made up of a material known as polyethylene tetraphthalate. This material absorbs high amount of UV radiation as opposed to the normal plastic bottles. If this bottle were to be put for recycling, then this bottle would be stripped of its label, cleaned and then sent to another family so that they can reuse it to provide large amounts of safe drinking water. So go ahead and drink your Fanta. But don't forget to recycle because the same empty bottle that you consider as waste can be used by a family in Africa to have safe drinking water. Wow, Manazi, what a cool talk. Um, you know, oh God, every time I go to recycle my bottles of water, I'm definitely going to think about that, that and what an amazing call to action. So everybody remember to recycle those bottles, so important. Now we want to know what the judges think of that. So I'm going to go to Joe actually for the next question. So uh, thanks a million for that, Manazi. It was really, really interesting. And you spoke about the, the Wadi devices and how they can be used time and time again and, and so on. And obviously you're, you're aiming these at, at, as you said, like, families in Africa. I'm just wondering the, the cost of production of them, how viable are they to produce lots of them to get them out there? Like, are these expensive things to, to make? No. So um, the body devices themselves are made, they're very sustainable devices. First of all, they come with a two-year warranty. So, and a single device can be shared by, say, a community. So up to 10 families can use the same body device. So you don't need multiple devices because these are targeted in very low. So it's very easy to, uh, you know, have less number of devices. And the materials needed to make these are also not very expensive. And these, uh, the company which makes them, which is Helios, is funded by the United Nations as well as the WHO. So they get a lot of international funding. And uh, there are certain ground level NGOs that support this cause as well. So the material you need to make the device is not very expensive. The raw material you need, which is just the pet bottle, which is, you buy in bulk. So the NGOs buy pet bottles in bulk and they're distributed in the villages. So there's no cost in, involved there. And another thing that I would like to add was Wadi was very important because it actually helped these families save money because the money they would use to buy the wood or coal was then saved and they could use it for other resources such as education. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Fantastic, great question, Joe, and fantastic answer, Manazi. So now I believe we're on to our final contestant before our break. Would you believe it? Already we're halfway through our list of contestants. So next, I have the pleasure of introducing Elena. So Elena is a PhD student currently working at Chagask, um, Agricultural and Food Development Authority, and her work is focused on milk processing in the Food Chemistry and Technology Department. So I have the pleasure of introducing Elena Hayes, and her talk is entitled, What Made Drinking Milk? 
possible. Over to you, Elena. Have you ever heard of lactose intolerance? Ever wondered why some people are able to digest milk while others can't? Well, let me tell you the story about the evolution of a little enzyme known as lactase. And I bet you'd be even more surprised to hear that a famine had something to do with the evolution of this little enzyme. So globally, about 65 to 70% of people are actually lactose intolerant. But if you look at the spread across the world, this is not evenly distributed. In Europe, only about 20% of people are lactose intolerant, while in Asia, Africa, and parts of South America, people are, the percentage is as high as about 80%. So why is this the case? Um, so let's go back to this enzyme lactase. So lactase is an enzyme that digests the sugar lactose, which is found in milk. So lactose is a sugar that is made up of two sugars bonded together. And the enzyme lactase breaks this bond and allows us to digest lactose. However, if you are lactose intolerant, your body does not produce the enzyme lactase, and therefore you cannot digest lactose. So what has all this got to do with an uneven distribution? Uh, so mammals will drink milk as a baby. Um, so lactase is really important in their diet. But most mammals then after about a year will stop producing milk and they'll stop drinking milk. And so the enzyme lactase then no longer becomes important in their diet and it stops working. About 10,000 years ago, however, in Europe, dairy farming was quite popular and some of the dairy farmers started drinking milk because of its high nutritional content. And they found that during times of famine, the people who were drinking milk, while they may have felt the side effects of lactose intolerant because they um, would have been at the time, they still survived because of the other nutritional qualities in the milk. So while they may have felt a bit sick, they survived. And then they found that um, the need to digest lactose became important again. So a mutation developed in the body where the enzyme lactase actually kept working on into adulthood. And so these people who, were, who had this mutation were able to digest lactose as an adult, and this became genetically advantageous. So it got passed down through the generations. And it's actually known as one of the fastest evolutionary mutations in human history. So why was this only the case in Europe, though? Well, the simple answer is that dairy farming wasn't really relevant to people in Asia or Africa or South America because it wasn't common practice. So this mutation that allowed people to digest lactose would not have been advantageous to them. So they just they didn't develop. So the next time when you're drinking a glass of milk, if you are able to, of course, you can thank your European ancestors and the famines that allowed it all to happen. Another fantastic talk all about milk, one of my favourite drinks. Um, well done, Elena. What a, and a, and a really, really cool talk as well. Who, who knew that there was a connection between famines and milk and lactose intolerance? Who knew? Um, this is what I love about FameLab. It's, it's, it's finding out all these nuggets of information that we wouldn't otherwise have found out. I'm going to call on Niamh now to ask a question of Elena. Um, in terms of what was what caused the famine that caused it in in the originally did you say it was just you, you know like um back then the famines would have been kind of um they'd have come and gone like in cycles um so like a drought would have affected uh people a lot more back then than it would have now um so during those times when like crops and stuff would have failed the people who were drinking milk uh would have survived um compared to people who who wouldn't have Fantastic. Thanks so much, Neve, and thanks, Elena, for, for a great answer as well. So this now brings us to our interval act. So we actually have, or not in our interval act, but our mid-heat exercise. So I don't know about you guys, but uh, sitting at Zoom calls for extended periods of time certainly gets me a little bit stiff. So what I would like to do is I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Gillian Murphy. And Gillian is a FameLab collaborator and lecturer in the School of Applied Psychology at UC. And she's going to discuss how and why we suffer from Zoom fatigue and guide you in some simple at-home stretches that you can try out to keep yourself engaged and alert. I'm really looking forward to hearing this one. So over to you, Gillian. During the pandemic, 
lots of us have been engaging in more screen time than we ever have before. And all of us really have experienced the feeling of Zoom fatigue. And this is the name that researchers have given to the feeling of the way you can feel so exhausted after a long day of online learning or teaching. And there's been loads of research being conducted recently into why that is. Why is it so much more exhausting to engage with people online often than it is when we do it in person? And there's loads of reasons for it. One of them is um, how when we have our cameras on, a lot of the time we, we spend looking at the little self view uh, box down in the corner um, and that that is exhausting. Um, that it's effectively like looking in a mirror all day and we know that when people have to look in a mirror for a long period of time uh, they find it physically stressful and uh, it's a big cognitive demand to have to, to look at yourself like that um, but another reason why engaging with with people and learning online is so exhausting is simply that we don't get to move enough so uh, if we were having these fame lab heats in person we of course would all have had to exercise to get to the venue we'd be moving around inside the venue and exercising helps us feel more alert and it also helps our physical and mental well-being but even if you can't leave your desk or your couch or wherever you're watching this you can still use these evidence-based um, interventions to help you to kind of feel a bit more refreshed if you've had a long day. And a really simple way of doing this, if you haven't got the space or the time or the energy to engage in aerobic activity, is to simply stretch. Um, so we're really quickly here just going to show you three stretches that you can engage in uh, from the comfort of your desk or your couch. You could do them now during the break or you could engage in them while the talks are on in a minute. Um, these stretches are obviously really good for you physically, but also mentally uh, and emotionally. <laughs> so loads of benefits uh, to regular stretching. Uh, and you could think about incorporating these into your own routine um, if you work at a desk in particular. Um, so we'll start with some really simple stretch. Uh, so this stretch is simply just shrugging your shoulders. So you just want to bring your shoulders up to your ears and you just do this gently, bring them up and then bring them down. Um, and you can do this maybe 10 or 15 times and you'll start to feel the kind of tension in your shoulders kind of start to relax. Um, the next stretch after this is also for your kind of upper body area. And you start by just putting your hands together like this. Then you turn your hands over and then you push your hands up as high as you can. Um, you're not trying to lift everything here. Don't lift up your shoulders. Try and keep your shoulders down, keep your chin up um, and just lift up through your hands. All of these are gentle stretches. You shouldn't be feeling pain at any point. It should just be gentle, relaxing stretching as you kind of pull away the tension of the day. Um, and the last suggested stretch that we have for you is simply just to roll your neck. <laughs> so um, if you start by putting your, your neck down on your um, chest a little bit, and then you just roll your head to the side, you could hold your head here for about 10 or 15 seconds and then bring it back to the middle. And then you go around the other side again. Um, these are really good. A lot of this kind of neck, you know, shoulder area is where a lot of us kind of hold our tension when we've had a busy day and when we're suffering from Zoom fatigue. Um, so consider engaging in these. And research shows that actually stretching and engaging in aerobic exercise can help improve attention and memory, even in the very short term. Um, so hopefully, if you can engage in some of these, you'll be able to learn even more from our fantastic Fame Lab speakers. Wow, I feel better already. Thank you so much, Gillian. What a lovely interval. Um, as a you know, somebody who's into my yoga and stretching and all that kind of stuff, I cannot. Um, oh. Stretching is so powerful. Definitely get up every couple of couple of hours if you can and give yourself a good stretch. So fantastic, brilliant. So that means we're all ready for the next round, right? So that means we're on to our next contestant. So our next contestant is Omar. And Omar is an energy enthusiast. I'm already hooked. Uh, experienced in renewable energy, uh, energy systems modeling, hydrogen economy, and alternative fuels. So currently he is a Marie Curie Research uh, PhD fellow at UCC in the Step for Wind project, working on a floating offshore wind and hydrogen production. So over to Omar uh, Ibrahim, and his, his talk is entitled, Enjoy Your Greenalized Flight. Over to you, Omar. 
Oh god, I'm just getting back to the sky. Oh, hold on. Have you ever thought how much this enjoy your flight actually costs you? Environmentally, I mean. Okay, let me just quickly present you some numbers that would probably pull you a trauma from boarding your next flight. In order to meet the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees, the average CO2 equivalent per annum per person should stay below 2 tons. Do you know that your return ticket from Paris to New York is actually 2.2? This means that by doing that, you'll be consuming your allowed CO2 equivalent for the rest of the year. Crazy, isn't it? This comes out from burning the kerosene, which is the aviation's fuel, emitting CO2 and increasing the greenhouse gas emissions. This kerosene is actually a hydrocarbon, and this means that it's a chemical compound of carbons and hydrogen. So now the challenge is how to decarbonize this hydrocarbon. Well, if we can manufacture this kerosene in a synthetic form using already existing carbon in the cycle, this is what's so-called fissure drops. The carbon source of producing this hydrocarbon would be got either from direct air capture or from an industrial source already emitting CO2. And this is what's so-called electrofuels, this synthetic kerosene. But what about the hydrogen? We all know that the water molecule consists of oxygen and hydrogen. And with an electric supply, we can split the oxygen and hydrogen molecules. Yes, yes, this electric supply should be green. Nowadays, renewable energies are taking over day after the other. And potentially all the renewable energy sources are potential candidates for this green hydrogen production. Developers are now focused on producing dedicated farms just for hydrogen production. And this is for this usage and for other future projected usages for the hydrogen. So this means that an offshore turbine would be possibly greenalizing my next flight. Interesting. Does that work only for the commercial flights? No, this can be used in the rockets, ships and haulage. Nowadays, all the airlines are focused in shifting into these electric fuels. And now it's time for you as a passenger to be aware of that too, and pick the right airline. Do me a favor, and next time you're boarding, enjoy your green-alized flight. Fantastic talk, Omar. You definitely have me dreaming of uh, flights away, but albeit with a green mindset in mind. So being really careful, as you say. So now it's over to our judges. So I think I'm going to go to Deirdre. Deirdre, do you have a question for Omar? Hi, Omar. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk and also a hopeful one as well, because I'm sure it's something we all feel a bit guilty about when taking flights. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, think about which airline you're using. How, like, are there currently airlines that are able to do this or that are close to or how far away are we from um, having flights that are green allies? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, nowadays, the airlines are actually investing some funds in the research in order to get this into reality as, uh, as quickly as possible. But um, like the, the, the main challenge now is how we can produce this green hydrogen and how this can be got into reality for this much of huge uh, green hydrogen production. So by the year 2030, the green hydrogen could be taking over the normal production uh, methods for hydrogen. And this would all be needed for the synthetic kerosene in a commercial way. So by the year 2030, uh, this possibly technically could be, could be done. And uh, that would be the choice of the of the uh, of the airlines. And uh, now all the policy making um, are focused. Um, the climate policies and energy policies are focused on uh, on issuing some rules on the airlines. But you, as a passenger, now you can be following who's investing and who's not, who's not investing, and who's who's actually even uh, calculating the the carbon footprint of of, of the flight. Great, so thank that, you. So we does might that see. Your question? It does, yeah. We might see competition for who's the greenest rather than who's the cheapest. <laughs> Quite soon. 
Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That's okay, Omar. You're off the hook for the moment. You can relax. So next person that we have up is our contestant, Marta. So Marta is a neuroscientist who's currently working at University College Cork. She's been always interested in science communication and took part in FameLab competition in Poland before. Her talk is entitled 10%. I can't wait to hear more. Over to you, Marta. What if we could have superpowers? Travel in time? Feel no pain? Use telepathy and telekinesis? Scarlett Johansson is trying to convince us in her movie Lucy that all of it is possible, only if we could use more than 10% of our brain. However, how true is it actually that we are using only 10% of our brains? If we think that we are using only a small portion of our brain and the rest of this organ is completely inactive, then this is another nonsense. There is no completely inactive region in a healthy brain. If we think, though, that we are using at once only about 10% of brain cells, then maybe this is a little bit closer to the truth, although still 10% is a completely random number and it's not supported by any research. For example, when I'm talking now, a speech production center in my brain is now completely on fire, while other regions are maybe a little bit more relaxed. So what would have happened if I switched on all of my brain cells at once? Probably something similar would have happened to your car if you used at once all of its functions. So you would start braking, accelerating, switching the gear, switching on the lights, switching on the radio and so on and so forth. And I still think that your car would survive longer than I would with all of my brain cells switched on. Interestingly, there are people who are able to switch on more of their brain cells at once. However, this skill is not a source of their superpowers. It's a source of their suffering. We call these people epileptics. So how did this absurd idea about using only 10% of our brain get spread so widely? I think that this idea makes us happy. It makes us motivated. We are thinking we still have 90% of unused brain, which we can use to, for example, achieve some superpowers. But it doesn't really matter how much of our brain we use. It rather matters how good we are in using it. So we can always train our brain by interacting with other people, learning and experiencing new things. As it is with the car, it doesn't matter how intensely we use it, it matters how efficiently we use it. And maybe still, telekinesis or telepathy are out of the question, but we can always be a better version of ourselves. Another brilliant talk. So well done, Marta. At uh, 10% of our brains, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's so important just to be aware, as you said, of the quality versus quantity of the amount of brain that we're using. So how well are we using, how efficiently? Um, so I hope all of our judges' brains are fired up now for a good question. I'm going to go to Joe for a question there. Uh, hi, Marta. That was uh, really interesting and also very disappointing. So I always kind of hope that there was some superpower there that I haven't tapped into yet, but you've, you've gone and disappointed me. But um, I, I thought what you said towards the end was very interesting about using our brains better. And, and something that came to my mind when you were discussing is these um, interactive games that will say that they're brain training. I mean, the Nintendo had one a few years ago that was all the rage at the time, that would train your brain, keep it sharper and better. How effective are those things at, at keeping us sharp, those kind of games and interactive uh, programs? Uh, to be honest, I rather doubt that they worked at all, actually. Um, maybe they do, but we probably still don't really have enough research to see if they are effective. There are different things which definitely do work. And I hope that we will hear something about exercising our brain later today. 
um, and also about learning, for example, new languages, which is a great brain training. But I don't think that we should go for abstract um, games, which are not really well researched on. And I think it's just only um, a good product to sell, but it will not enrich our brain. Thanks very much. I've, I've wasted a lot of my time, so, but thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Brilliant question, Owen, and uh, 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 Joe, and and fantastic answer, Marta. I know I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I was I was really hoping for those brain training games that when I was seeing my age was going down and down, I was doing something positive. But you look, I'll keep going. I think I'll stick to my Sudoku. I think that's my brain training for for the day done. So thank you very much to our judges. Thank you so much again, um, Joe and uh, Marta, for those fantastic uh, questions and answers there. So on to our next contestants. We're on to Yasantha uh, Samarawik Rama. And so Yasantha uh, is a PhD student at Confirm Research Centre attached to Munster Technological University, MTU. And his research involves working in ultra-reliable, low-latency, at URLLC, Communication for Industry 4.0, with a focus on channel-aware construction of 5G polar codes. So over to you, Yusanta. Time for new pair of runners, specially customized for me. Color, cushion, type, design, everything I have in my mind. For mass customization, the production lines and industries are tailored based on customer requirements. For this purpose, communication between manufacturing stations, robots, and component assembly line is crucial. The fourth industrial revolution, the Industry 4.0, is turning towards wireless communication as an alternative to wired links. This offers improved mobility, scalability, and flexibility at a low cost. The smallest unit of wireless communication is a bit, and also bits are the language of digital transmission. So to transform all the information I mentioned, such as color, cushioning type, design, we need to use lots of bits, right? We group few of these bits and we create a data symbol. And a group of data symbols create a wireless data packet. You can visualize a wireless data packet just like this picture puzzle over here. All the building blocks in combination makes a final picture, right? Similarly, all the data symbols in combination makes a wireless data packet. So to accurately determine the picture details, it's very important to determine the building blocks correctly. This applies for wireless communication as well. At the receiver, it's crucial to determine the data symbols correctly. What happens if a data symbol is incorrect and an information packet is lost? Then the mobile robots would miss the deadline for a specific task and they would bump into each other. An entire manufacturing batch can be lost. There can be damages for machinery. Therefore, high reliability with low packet transmission time is crucial for wireless communication. However, wireless communication is facing significant challenges, especially at the industrial environments. There are moving people, robots, and also metallic surfaces. This obstructs the signal propagation. So at the receiver, signals arrive with low power, and symbols can tend to arrive with delays. This causes inter-symbol interference, which is the overlapping between the symbols. With this, it's very hard to identify a symbol independently and clearly. This lowers the reliability, and we need to retransmit, so the packet transmission time increases. However, all the scientific challenges are overcome by novel techniques. Researchers identified that information bits can be coded before transmission. This uses special algorithms to arrange the information bits in specific order. At the, at the decoder, the same algorithms are used to decode the information bits. Also, you can view uh, erroneous packet just like this with the error symbol. We can introduce an error correcting bit before transmission to correct this error and recover the original packet. And also we can introduce a gap between the data symbols, which will over overcome the overlapping between the data symbols. We identify this as a guard band. This is, with these techniques, it's really potentially possible to achieve high reliability with low packet transmission time for industrial communications. This is how the mass customization is becoming a reality in industrial environment with fast, reliable, and deterministic industrial communication protocols. Somebody knocks knocking my door. Oh, that's my uncle. But in the future, that may be the runners that I ordered just now. Thank you. Fantastic, Yasantha. Um, yeah, I'm definitely hoping that Amazon and, and the like when it comes to my online deliveries will be able to deliver that quickly. That would be really, really cool. Um, such another fascinating talk there, uh, this time about wireless communications, another subject that's so, so fascinating at the moment. 
Hey, Asanta, thank you so much uh, for your talk. It's obviously super relevant at the yeah. moment. I know your talk was more focused on uh, industry relations, but from our yeah. own work from home setup, so I'm sure we're all fighting for wireless. Is there things that we can do to minimize that inter symbol interference at home? Yeah, of course. Um, so inter symbol interference uh, mostly occurs because of the ob obstacles in the wireless channel. For example, if you have a center and receiver in between, if you have some obstacles, then signal will hit it and come with multiple copies. So that creates delay when it receives at the uh, receiver. So that occurs the inter simple interference. So basically, if you're working from home for home Wi-Fi, the best thing is to have the Wi-Fi router somewhere above and also to minimize um, obstacles uh, while um, receiving the Wi-Fi signal. So that's that's the main thing. Um, yeah, so mainly it's about the obstacles on the path. So thank you. Great, thank you. I will make sure to do that. Fantastic. Um, I'm always always open for tips and tricks on Wi-Fi. Um, so really, really welcome uh, tips there from me, Asantha. So on to our next speaker then, we have Lekka. So Lekka is a researcher at the School of Microbiology and the president of UCC Indian Alumni Community. She's also a founder of the ATMA Indian Dance uh, Troupe and the local coordinator for Cork at uh, Height of Science. So Lekka Menon Margasi Gassari is going to give us a talk entitled Not Yet Recycled. Over to you, Lekka. I want you all to remember three numbers today, 40, 50, and 60. Let us time travel. In 2019, 40 kilograms of plastic waste was found in the stomach of a whale in the Philippines. Moving forward, in 2050, there are more plastics in the oceans than fish. Uh, if, you start continue, if you continue to use the plastic the same way as we do now. Today, 60 kilograms of plastic waste is being produced by a person per year in Ireland. We are the top producers of plastic waste in Europe. We all know the problem. How are we going to solve it? There are a few things which we can do to reduce the impact of plastic waste. Number one, reduce and reduce the use and production of single-use plastics. Use compostable materials. Many cork takeaways have switched to compostable packaging, unlike the plastic packaging. Number two, recycle as much as we can. Only 9% of the total plastic made have, have been recycled so far. Use bioplastics. Plastics made from plants, bacteria, uh, food waste, and also seaweeds. My work is mainly on the production of bioplastics from dairy wastewater. So I would like to share some ideas how bioplastics can make a difference. Bioplastics are biodegradable. That is, they just break down in days and weeks, unlike plastics, which take hundreds of years. They also have a potential to reduce harmful carbon dioxide emissions by 30%. They use less resources and less energy. Major applications of bioplastics in the current scenario is the food wrappers, which are edible, and this is made from corn and shellfish industry byproducts. So you just peel them and you just eat them rather than binning them. Banana peels, which can make bioplastics for electrical insulation of cables. And Lego toys, some of them which are in the market, they're all bioplastics. Finally, we do not have a plan B as we do not have a planet B. So let us all join hands to preserve planet Earth and all life in it. Let us hope for a world free of plastic. Thank you. Wow, fantastic talk, uh, Lekka. Uh, I, for one, I've recently come across uh, edible coffee cups, actually, um, on my travels to Waterford over the weekend. Uh, one of the takeaway providers was offering uh, edible coffee cups. So it kind of tastes like a hard biscuit. So who knows? So Lekka, fantastic. Well done. Hi, Lekka. Um, thanks for a great talk and a topic very close to my heart as well. I fully agree with your call to action. Um, so this, I suppose, is a question out of personal interest as well. So I've seen increasing use of 
um, kind of containers that are single use containers, but are, are made from, you know, vegetables or, you know, they're, they're going to be recyclable um, or biodegradable. But sometimes when you look it up, it says that they're only biodegradable if you use an industrial composter, which doesn't happen when, you know, you put it in your bin or when you put it in a green recycling bin. And I'm just wondering, I mean, is that true? And to what extent can these kind of edible um change in materials solve that problem yeah so um thanks for your question um, it's quite interesting one actually uh, a point to note that not all bioplastics are biodegradable you know there there are some bioplastics which are non bio which are made from just renewable sources as well non renewable sources and so they are not degradable at all um so keep bearing that in mind um if we look into uh the current scenario we have companies and we are looking for a greener environment we are looking for a sustainable solution always and um so i would actually go in for i can give you a example actually adidas they are actually making shoes uh which are biodegradable you know and so they include um bioplastics like uh, polyhydroxy alkylates which, which we call it as phas or phb and they also give you an enzyme solution so basically what they do is if you feel that your shoe is you know is, you cannot use it anymore you just add that enzyme and it just degrades in like 90 days so that's a, that's an idea which came from a big company you know and uh, now you you talked about even the coffee cups which you, which are edible so those, that's called circular economy actually so basically in bulgaria there's a big industry where in you get a coffee cup which is made from grains just grains uh and they add a little bit of uh, phas in it so basically which are edible you know they're edible bioplastics and you just have to drink it and within a week if you you can consume it just like a biscuit so it's like you have solutions out there it's just that we're not going to bring it to the you know globally <laughs> i hope i've really answered your question did you? It does. Thank you. That's really interesting because there's so much greenwashing out there. It's good to know what is, you know, actually uh, useful and actually biodegradable. So thanks for clarifying. Thanks, Deirdre. Brilliant. Super, Deirdre. Um, and super, Lekka. Fantastic answer. So we're going to go on to our next contestants. Hard to believe that we have one, two, three, four people left. OK, the, the, we're flying through all of our talks. Uh, fascinating talks uh, that they are. So our next talker, our next participant is Minka. So Minka is a 26 year old Dutch PhD student in UCC studying the effects of diet and exercise on the brain and um, specifically interested in mood and cognitive behavior, neurogenesis and neuroinflammation. So over to you Minka Nota with exercise for the mind. Early in the morning, I run out of the door to start a long day of experiments. Of course, I was kind of worried that I might sleep through my alarm and get in late, so I hardly slept at all and coffee barely does a trick to keep me awake. I get home late in the evening, exhausted from the lack of sleep and busy work day, and all I want to do is sit down, have a glass of wine, and order takeout. <clears throat> but I promised myself I'd do a workout today. Maybe I should just try to catch up on some sleep instead. The next day, rinse and repeat. Sound familiar? I don't know about you, but when I'm busy like that, the last thing on my mind is exercise. But then I don't feel so good, and I want to work out even less, and I feel worse, and so on and so on. Why is that? We all know that exercise is important to keep our bodies healthy, to maintain our weight, to protect our heart, to strengthen our muscles. But what about the way we think and feel? It might come as no surprise, but Exercise plays a huge role in keeping our brain healthy too. Research has shown that exercise can reduce the risk of depression, relieve anxiety and stress, and even reduce the symptoms of disorders such as ADHD and PTSD. But how does that work? Well, when we exercise, we increase the release of dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, and endorphins, which calm us down, help us focus, and just generally make us feel good. Exercise also increases something called neurogenesis, which is the birth of new neurons in the brain. And in doing so, this improves our memory and helps prevent age-related cognitive decline. Now, you might be thinking that all sounds great, but 
I don't have time to spend hours in the gym every day. <laughs> or maybe you're like me and you absolutely despise going for a run. Well, I have good news for you. You don't need to run a marathon to get all these amazing benefits. We need about 30 minutes of moderate exercise a day. And nobody said you need to do it all in one go. Just five or 10 minutes here and there throughout the day does wonders for your mental health. And perhaps the best news of all, as long as it gets your heart rate going and your blood pumping, it can be absolutely anything you want. I personally love to dance to my favorite tunes while doing household chores, which obviously gets bonus points for efficiency, right? Or when my dog greets me with a toy after I come home from work, or just get a quick tug of war session in. None of that really feels like exercise, but it always puts a huge smile on my face. So remember, you don't need to go hard, you just need to go. couldn't agree with you more Minka my little dog Lola uh every ooh, half an hour uh, you know quite lovingly drops a, a a toy at my feet and it's you know I have no other excuse but I have to throw the ball or I have to do something and it's fantastic for her and it's fantastic for me so I'm delighted to hear there's a, a strong sound evidence there um scientifically as well Joe I think it's your turn to ask a question of Minka uh thanks and, and Minka actually the, the first question I had uh, that came to my mind you'd actually answered it at the end there about i was going to ask what kind of exercises would you recommend but you've you've kind of answered that by just i suppose anything that gets the blood going so i mean i suppose the other question that i'd have is that you uh you're studying the effects of not just exercise but diet on the brain and are there specific foods that are good for a uh, good mood food i suppose what would you recommend yeah so i think katie actually um touched on this in her talk um things that are high in fiber are really great for us um there's also foods that are high in uh, polyphenols i think uh chocolate actually has them and coffee as well um which is great news although i think you'd have to consume a lot of them to get the benefits and then on the flip side there's foods that are high in sugar and saturated fat that aren't so great for us, which is actually what I'm studying at the moment. Um, so I, I would recommend to avoid those. Uh, could you give a couple of examples of those ones? Um, so pretty much all the delicious snacks uh, that you can find in the grocery store, unfortunately, are high in sugar and, and saturated fat, which aren't so great for us, although on the flips, they also kind of make us feel good. So um, what I'm actually kind of studying is the, you know, the, the happiness that you get from getting a snack is weighing up against the bad effects of the um, nasty ingredients in them. Okay, that's great, thank you. Thanks. Brilliant, Joe, and brilliant uh, answer, Minka, as well. Fascinating topic. Uh, so we'll go on to our next speaker now. So that is Jack. So Jack is a PhD student entering his second year. He's studying the manner that both good and bad bacteria break down bile in the human digestive system and, attempt to un and attempts to uncover the reason these ba uh, bacteria perform this action. So I'm really, really interested to hear what Jack has to say. His title of his talk is A Belly Full of Bile. Over to you, Jack Daly. Picture this, you're on a first date with the person of your dreams in the fanciest restaurant in town. The waiter brings you the house special, chicken goujons and chips, covered in ketchup. As he places this feast before you, he whispers, enjoy your meal. To which you politely retort, thanks, you too. The restaurant goes silent, your date's cutlery crashes to the table. Faces contorted in equal parts horror and confusion stare back at you. Thanks, you too, you monstrous fool, the waiter's not eating. Why would you say that? You've ruined this date and your one chance of love. This immense anger you channel at yourself manifests as a surge of hot, bitter bile rises up your throat. And in this moment you find yourself asking, what is bile? How does it affect my health? And do the bacteria in my gut play a role in this crosstalk? Well, firstly, bile is made in your liver from cholesterol and then stored in your gallbladder. 
From there, it's released into your gut upon the consumption of food, particularly fatty foods. You see, bile breaks down the fats in your gut the same way that washing up liquid breaks down the oil in your dishes. Like the dishes you gorge the family meal deal for six off because you were comfort eating and ultimately alone. So, is this all that bile does? Well, no. You see, an important ingredient of bile are bile acids. Now, these bile acids come in many shapes and sizes and can trigger receptors in your gut that can influence cholesterol levels, blood sugar levels, and even weight gain. Now, interestingly, each type of bile acid triggers these receptors to different degrees. So, if I had more of bile acid A than you, I might have higher cholesterol, whereas you might have higher levels of bile acid B than I and have lower blood sugar levels. So you see, the composition of all the bile acids in your gut, or your bile acid signature, is directly affecting your health. So, how do bacteria come into this? So some of these bile acids are actually pretty harmful to the bacteria that inhabit your gut. Just as harmful as your parents constantly asking why you don't have a date for your cousin's wedding. Hopefully, COVID will cancel it. So, to combat this, certain bacteria in your gut have evolved a very specific mechanism that allows them to change the chemistry of some of these bile acids into different forms that help the bacteria to survive better. But, by changing the chemistry of these bile acids, they are in turn changing the way these bile acids trigger the receptors in your gut. So, the community of all the bacteria in your gut, or your microbial fingerprint, which is unique to you, is directly affecting your bile acid signature which is directly affecting your health. So the research I'm engaged with is investigating how these bacteria could offer new routes of therapy for several diseases. So the next time you feel that pang of loneliness and that rush of bile up your throat, just think of me. Fantastic, Jack. I think we all will think of you after that talk. Certainly, you you described it so dramatically. Uh, yeah, bring bring back the restaurant someday soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to that that feeling of ordering and probably saying something a bit foolish. But hey, uh, so Jack, now it goes over to our judges. Uh, so Neve, I'm going to dedicate this question to you. Great. Thanks so much uh, for such an energetic talk, uh, Jack. I absolutely loved it. Um, I'd love to hear more as well about the new routes for therapy that you mentioned at the end too. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, we're kind of engaging at the moment. Uh, part of the work was looking how to treat uh, chronic diarrheal diseases. So that's kind of one um, route. Uh, so basically there's um, chronic diarrhea would be anything that lasts longer than two weeks. Um, so it's quite common a lot of people and in particular there's one uh, cause of this so kind of like colitis IBS but uh, there's also bile acid diarrhea which is actually just too much bile acid in your gut um, so one way of treating uh, responding to that is getting these bacteria that are actually interfering with the receptors so basically like the, one of the receptors in your gut is called FXR and this basically acts as a a stopcock like in a toilet so as much bile that goes into it if there's too much uh the bile hits that receptor and it says stop making bile and um, so some of these bacteria can actually so if there's issues with triggering this receptor as bile acids such as bile acid diarrhea these bacteria can change the chemistry of these bile acids into forms that can trigger this receptor quicker therefore stopping the bile acid from going into the gut which is essentially cutting off the uh, the feedback loop you know um and there's there's several other things that would be the one i'm focused on myself um but yeah i mean it's been used to treat um ihcp in a pregnancy um you know a common symptom of that manifests as uh, itching and so um certain probiotics can be now utilized to kind of stop this um from happening that's super interesting and it sounds like really important work i'm i'll be curious to hear how it goes yeah thank you also i should uh clarify uh i wasn't in the bio but i'm from university college cork as well and i'll absolutely get it in the neck now if i don't say that like <laughs> <laughs> well done you got it in there in the end jack well done well done Cheers, well, spotted, yeah, yeah. Very good. <laughs> well done jack we're on to our second to last participant now. Uh, hard to believe the evening has absolutely flown. Uh, we're on to now Aileen. So Aileen works as a digital design verification engineer in Qualcomm uh, Technologies. 
and is part of a team designing the latest Snapdragon processors. I'm already intrigued. So Aileen's talk is entitled Blockchain, the Technology Behind Cryptocurrency. Over to you, Aileen. Blockchain is technology behind cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. But what is blockchain? Imagine we're out for the day with a group of friends. We're going for food, drinks and activities. And every time we get a bill, one member of the group will pay the bill and we'll settle our debts at the end of the day. They've nominated me to keep a record of all the transactions that occur so we know who owes what. The only thing is, I'm feeling a little selfish and I actually decide to create a couple of fake transactions and I write them down in my notebook and at the end of the day, it means that I owe less money. The group is unaware I've done this and still trusts me. What would be a way to get around this? Imagine if each person in the group kept their own notebook of the transactions. And before we go to write down the transactions, we actually come to a consensus and agree about the details of that transaction, such as who owe who what money and how much it was for. Mm. Now, we all write it down in our notebook and it becomes very difficult to create a fake transaction because we would have to convince more than 50% of the network that our fake transaction is true. As an added layer of security, for each transaction that we write down in the notebook, we add something called a cryptographic hash, kind of like a fingerprint. It uniquely identifies the block and the contents of that transaction. So it says who owes who what and how much money. So if anyone tries to edit the contents of that transaction, it will be very clear as the fingerprint changes and we know it will be a different block. In a blockchain, each transaction actually points to the previous transaction before it. That transaction points to the previous transaction before that. Therefore, we create a chain of transactions. And we can actually contain a lot more information than just transaction information on our blockchain. So we'll abstract our transaction away to become simply a block. This block, the chain of blocks, is the blockchain. It contains all the information that allows us to have a distributed mode of trust with no middleman. It gives power back to the people. Wow, Eileen, I've always wondered what blockchain was. That is the best description I've ever heard anyway. Uh, well done. What a, a really, really great talk. Um, so Aileen, we're now going to give an opportunity for the judges. So we're going to go to Deirdre again. Hi, Aileen. Thanks for such Hi. a clear talk. Um, I'm like Emer, and I, I didn't really know what blockchain was. I kind of had a vague idea. And it's funny because often we think of it as this thing, you know, kind of dark and hidden, but actually the way you describe it is, you know, it's like community and so open and, and transaction. Uh, but my question is actually because Emer brought it up at the start and I have to ask, because I assume it's related to your talk, what's Snapdragon? Oh, sorry. Um, that's like a little processor that's found in phones and laptops and things like that. Um, that's just like a, a product um, that Qualcomm brings. Ah, so it's not related to the blockchain. No, it's actually not. I'm just interested in blockchain. It's kind of like a, it's sort of, um, it's all kind of like software hardware, but no, it's not directly related to what I work on. Oh, well, even more impressive that you could give such a clear talk on something that you're not working directly on. Thanks. Fantastic. Really, really cool. And as I say, yeah, definitely. Um, that idea of shared transactions and everything, you just made it so clear. So well done, Aileen. Absolutely brilliant. So everybody, I can't believe it, but we're actually on to our last contestant um, for this evening. So, you know, what, what is left for me to do? I'll need to introduce them. So that is Andrea. So Andrea is a 24-year-old master's student at Tyndall National um, uh, National Institute, UCC, with a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering. Uh, he has different hobbies such as music, fitness, and all the matters related to nutrition and uh, body health. So kind of wrapping up everything we've talked about today. Um, so Andrea is going to uh, give his talk and his talk is entitled, Put Those Cookies Down. Over to you, Andrea. Have you ever been thinking about yourself? 
Well, I actually did lately and I realized that if I had to describe my whole life with just three words, I'd say I am hungry. And this is actually what I want to talk to you about today, hunger. Because generally speaking, it has always been considered a very bad thing for our body. And I will never forget what my grandmother used to tell me when as a child I was feeling just a little bit dizzy. So she used to say, don't worry honey, it is just some low blood sugar. And in the meantime, she was pushing another spoon of lasagna inside my mouth. But that's the actual question. Is it hunger always a bad thing? Spoiler alert, it is not. Because in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Dr. Yoshinomi Ozumi, found out that hunger can actually be one of the most powerful weapons we have for reducing the risks of heart disease, diabetes, neurological problems, and even cancer. So, how does it work? Well, I'm sure you already know that most tissues of our body can replace the old cells with the new ones. But then, where did dead cells end up? Well, inside our body, there is a mechanism that gets rid of all the trash. And this mechanism is called autophagy, which literally means self-eating. Now, I want you to think about your biology class during middle school. And I'm sure you can remember the structure of a cell inside of which we find very specific organelles called lysosomes. The lysosomes can be considered the stomachs of the cells because they have some specific digestive enzymes <clears throat> which allow the body to convert very bad things such as bacteria and viruses into amino acids. Then the amino acid can be used for creating new cells or for as a source of energy, for instance. Now, when the autophagy doesn't work properly inside a human being, the person can actually develop a very serious disease, such as Alzheimer and cancer, because infected cells start to accumulate inside the body. And here is actually the great discovery of Dr. Ozumi. Thanks to starvation or fasting, the autophagy process gets more intense because our body starts to use cellular garbage as a source of energy. So just skipping some meals, we can actually help our body to clean itself. So next time you are just feeling a little bit hungry and you are going to grab those cooking on the kitchen counter, just ask yourself, can I just endure this discomfort a bit longer? What a cool uh, talk. Absolutely so cool, Andrea. And what a way to finish off our proceedings today for the FameLab Car Keys 2021. So, Joe, I'm going to come to you in a second for a question there. Hi, Andrea. Um, just a, a, a very quick question for you is um, your background is in the Lake Eng and you've, you're now a master's at, at Tyndall. Do you, you obviously then have this uh, passion for nutrition. Do you see uh, some way that you can make the two come together? Is that something that you're looking at? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, actually, let's say I have both a passion for engineering and on the other hand, also a passion for all the matters that, matters that concern medicine in general. So I think uh, the way I can have to put in contact uh, these two, uh, two passion I have is basically to start working on um, medical devices. So in, those, in that case, I will, I will have a very consistent part of electronic design, but on the other hand, I will have the chance actually to learn and study more and more about uh, the body in general. So I think I can, let's say, th these two kinds of passion I have can go hand by hand in a way. Thank you. Welcome. Fantastic, uh, Andrea, another great question, Joe. 
So everybody, that is the end. 15 people have presented today, uh, this evening at FameLab 2021. So now it gives me the pleasure of sending our lovely judges off for a quick deliberation. So the judges are going to now go uh, to a breakout room for their deliberations. So now it gives me the opportunity to explain to our viewers how the voting is going to work. So the judges are going to vote uh, in the deliberation room there, but we also have an opportunity for the audience to vote as well. So on your screen now, uh, you will shortly see some instructions. So I'm just going to very quickly run through uh, all of the people who spoke th uh, this afternoon. So in summary, we had Katie Gazetta with our microbial ecosystem, our first speaker. Second, we had Melazine Pigeon with smart contact lenses for cows. Third, we had Owen Griffin with blue veins of gold. Fourth, then we had Elite de Russo, why is milk white? Fifth was Fernando Diaz, the frozen Pandora's box. And number six was Manazi Nadkarmi with water, waste and wadi. Number seven was Elena Hayes, what makes drinking milk possible? Uh, number eight is Omar Ibrahim with Enjoy Your Greenalized Flight. Number nine was Marta Braca with her talk 10%. Number 10 was Yazantha Samarawik Rama with his talk Hello Wireless Transform Our Industries. Number 11, 11 even, was Lekka Menon Marga Margasri with her title Not Yet Recycled. Number 12 was Minka Nota with Exercise for the Mind. Number 13 was Jack Daly, a belly full of bile. Number 14 was Aileen McCabe, Blockchain, the Technology-Based Cryptocurrency. And last, but by no means least, we just had Andrea Federico with Put Those Cookies Down. Okay, so now you have the opportunity to vote for that. There will, of course, be an audience vote. And now we're going to come to our interval act. So, as you're aware, this is our final year of FameLab uh, in Ireland. So we're inviting you to relive some of the best interval acts of the past Ireland national finals. Back in 2014, research scientist, comedian and cartoonist Maria Boyle told us all about the bit near the end before the results. A hilarious explanation and exploration of what scientists do. And I know there's a few scientists around the table here tonight. So sit back. Relax and get ready for some feel-good scientific comedy. Over to you, Maria. Hello. Hello. Hey, there you go. Um, so my name is actually Dr. Maria Boyle. I work as a research scientist. The other things are merely distractions for me in the lab. Um, so this is actually the first time I've given this talk because it'd be really weird if. I gave a talk called this before. Actually, um, I have to say, all the speakers were actually amazing. Could we get a round of applause just for them all? Because absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad I'm not competing against them for a vote, although I would appreciate your love. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, Dr. Maria Boyle, and I have a PhD. Um, actually, uh, we'll do a show of hands. How many people work in research here? Uh, oh, okay. Um, would like to work in research? Like to mock scientists? Okay. Um, so I, I have a PhD, and I'll give you an idea of what the title doctor is, use, is useful for. People thinking I'm the other kind of doctor. Um, so when people go, is there a doctor in the house? I can't really answer because... I have a PhD, it's a doctorate of philosophy. Like, I can't tell you why someone's dying. I could only philosophize as to why that's happening. Although, if any of you would like to show me anything for like 60 euro, I'd totally look at it. <laughs> can't help, but I'll have a look. <laughs> um, relatives who send cards to me writing doctor as if it's a joke. Dr. Maria Boyle, have a happy birthday to our favorite daughter. Thanks, Mom. Um, as a comeback, oh, and I'd need somebody to read this in a good loud voice. Sure. Uh, you dropped that beaker of acid. That was pretty clumsy. That's Dr. Clumsy to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have to fill in like some sort of incident report. It's great. Um, 
And then uh, it's on side show presentations to give the illusion that I know what I'm talking about, which is why it's always handy to take it off. Um, so these are things, I, I draw uh, cartoons, so you can do science and art together. Some people would say that makes you a genius. I say it makes you just easily distracted um, by things. So these are questions that people have asked me when I was doing my, uh, my PhD. What's your research on? What's the point of that? What will you do after? Are you going to be a teacher? Did you hear that uh, Sean got a job? Did you hear that they're buying a house? What do you mean you have no money? Can't you get a summer job? When do you finish your PhD? You finish it now? Now? And it leads to this question. Why are you sad all of the time? <laughs> so other than that, please do a PhD because they're awesome. Um, so some people think that scientists uh, say Eureka all the time in the lab because like, this is it. We, we found it. We've discovered it. In my experience, <laughs> this is... What happens in the lab? We swear a lot. I swear a lot. Um, this thing at the end, I hate science. I've said that way too many times in my life to nobody and way too loudly, and people have walked away. Um, but there was this thing in science, like the, if at first you don't succeed, try two more times so that your failure is statistically significant. <laughs> Scientists, we like to do things in trees. You know, like rock, paper, and scissors? It's like, you know, best out of tree. It's exactly like that, except a lot of emphasis is put on paper. <laughs> you know, it's true. Um, so you can use science to answer uh, the bigger questions in the world. And because I have a PhD, what I'm about to tell you must be true. This is a science part. Concentrate. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll start with physics. Uh, it seems like mostly maths, but then they bring out the lasers and spaceships, and suddenly we're all interested. Why does toast fall butter side down? Because butter is a hero. Biology explains things like the birds and the bees, then explains why they're genetically incompatible and their love must die. So I'm a microbiologist, so this is uh, the truth behind the five-second rule, if any of you um, guys are into that. <laughs> into that. Um, so like when you drop your food on the ground, such as your toast, because it links back to the other thing, um, it, germs get five seconds to decide if they want to get on the toast for a second. <laughs> this guy decided yes to quit their germ job. That's uh, a micromanager. Yeah! Oh, there's going to be more of this. To get a passport on a disease visa. Or disease Uh This is their leaving party. A lot of small talk. Huh? And he's saying it toast to toast. And I showed this to somebody and they went, it looks like a great party because they've got coke. This guy... He was sniffing because it's emotional. <laughs> and then they got a last minute to pack because he leaves the last second. This is, that was meant to be toast, but two people was like, that looks like a door. <laughs> to opportunity, no. Um, so like toast, it's the promised land. If it lands, butter side up. Because it links back to the other thing. <laughs> um, biology can help make things better. Or worse, depending. How to make a panda. I like my steaks like I like my panda. Rare. And 100% panda. Oh, yum, yum. You're so yum, yum. So uh, this is me explaining how to make a panda. Uh, first, you take a polar bear. Polar bears are exceptionally strong. They can um, swipe a uh, seal out of the water with one claw or open a jam jar without using a tea towel. So you take a uh, polar bear and then you can take mascara, which is a great way to poke yourself in the eye with something covered in ink if you're a girl. So polar bear plus panda plus gin <laughs> equals panda. Obviously, not enough gin drinkers. <laughs> you could also insert PhD 
uh, for Jen. It's basically you cry and then your mascara runs and then people are like, what's wrong with you? But they don't ask that because you're on a bus. Um, <laughs> so the next bit is chemistry. The only one to contain any mystery. Oh. Audience laugh. <laughs> So this guy saying, any coal is a goal. I don't know how to like do the noise of a man chatting somebody off, <laughs> clearly. Um, I know something harder than the diamonds. You can bucky my balls anytime. That's Buckminster Fullerene. All of these are examples of carbon dating. Uh, related to this, diamonds are a girl's best friend, but you should hear the stuff that diamonds see. Better behind her back. That dress is way too small for her, and her fat arse! <laughs> That's why you should always get conflict-free diamonds. <laughs> I know you're groaning, that means you like it. Um, <laughs> so the next bit is a shameless uh, plug to things that I do, which um, are obviously connected to the, the science, not really science, and drawing. It brings joy to people's lives. Yes, joy. If it's in bold, it must be true. I make greetings cards, and I covered this in clip art because clip art is amazing. Look, this woman's trying to steal the cat. <laughs> Give me the cat! That's why I used it. Happy birthday! The candle can burn slowly into dark nothingness or be snuffed out now in its prime. Something to think about on your special day. <laughs> This card is late because I forgot, or I'm very lazy, or I was helping Batman fight crime. This is a, a card for um, somebody, like if you're single and um, friends of yours get married, it's a good idea to send them something like this. You're married, you may make me believe in love again, but it reminded me that I'm so alone. <laughs> On the inside of that I put, but forget about me, you guys have a great day. This is a Father's Day card because Father's Day is coming up. Dad, I would love to be half the man that you are. It's for a man. But genetically, I already am. <laughs> this one's also vaguely science-based. Happy Father's Day. From your fastest sperm. <laughs> it's the thrilling end bit. For low expectations of thrilling. Um, I, like, I, I love like, science in general, but one of my favorite things is uh, I quite like the whole space exploration thing. Um, are you guys aware of the Mars rover? So it's like basically this robot that they, they put into uh, space, basically put up on Mars, to see if there could have been life on Mars. And the answer is maybe, uh, a long time ago. It's a bit of a fixer-upper, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but like, I became fascinated uh, with the Mars rover and um, I made a song up about the Mars rover. I know! How talented is this woman? <laughs> Says no one. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll sing the song for you, if that's okay. <clears throat> and, and you can join in. <laughs> no, come on everyone, you all know it. Um, <clears throat> I've been a Mars rover for many a day. And now the Earth is so far away. Took photos of landscapes and talked to a stone. A constant reminder that I'm all alone. Because it's not like Wally. Not like Wally at all. Just a lonely Mars rover with no Eva to call. Went to a crater, saw nothing at all. Mars looks exactly like Total Recall, <laughs> except with no Arnie or people to hurl, no giant space station or three-breasted girl, and everyone, because it's not like Wally, not like Wally at all, just a lonely Mars rover with no Eva to call. Thank you. These guys are amazing. This is my website. The cards are real. <laughs> Thank you.
So welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed Maria's talk there. I laughed uh, throughout that talk. What an amazing talk and making me reminisce over being in the one room together at Celebration Science Communication. But I think you'll all agree. What a fantastic evening of science communication. 15 participants uh, at our Cork Heats this evening. The judges did not have an easy task, uh, but I have gotten a notification in my ear to say that they've come up with their de with their decision. Not easy, as I say, to do. So I'm going to welcome the judges back in. And I'm actually going to throw it out to Deirdre, who is our kind of chief judge, uh, to give us a little bit of feedback about uh, the talks that they heard this evening before we announce our winners. And we'll shortly then, as Deirdre is getting ready, we'll be shortly announcing over Facebook our audience vote winner. So you can check that out in our live stream just below this video. So over to you, Deirdre, a bit of feedback. Thanks very much, Emer. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say to everybody who took part, thank you so much for a really enjoyable evening with so many absolutely fantastic talks. I have learned so much and been so entertained throughout the whole thing. Um, and one thing we were commenting on when we were discussing was that it's really difficult doing this virtually as well. So an additional fair play to you for doing this and sending in your video and coming to this meeting. Um, it's been it's been great. Um, so another comment we made in, in the judges room was that you never really believe a judge when they say, oh, it's a difficult task. And actually, it was incredibly difficult. And I betwe think between the three of us, you nearly could have had every single person top or at least in the top three. It was really difficult to discuss this. And apologies for being late. That's because we were discussing it and trying to figure out just who slightly picked <laughs> the others um, to the top position. But uh, it in no way reflects on anyone. If you're not in the top two, uh, your talks were all fantastic. And I'd encourage all of you to keep doing science communication and find as many opportunities as you can to talk about your research, either the topic you talked about today or other research, because you're all great communicators. And I think it would be a good thing for the world to hear more from all of you. So thanks very much. Brilliant, Deirdre. I couldn't agree with you more as somebody who works in science communication. Um, oh, yeah, just keep talking your science. Start those conversations because all of you have started a conversation uh, about your topic. So now, my friends, it brings me to um, that bit that you're all sitting there eagerly waiting to find out well, who is our runner up and who is our winner for tonight. So what I might do, if this was in person, of course, naturally, I'd have you all doing a big drum roll. So we're going to do a virtual drum roll in the background. OK, imagine that drumming of feet as we announce our runner up first. So our runner up um, was an, a fantastic speaker uh, and his name is Fernando Diaz. So congratulations, Fernando, as being our first runner up. Thank you so much. I think for organizing the event because online is very complex. So thank you so much for everything. Well done, Fernando. So now, my friends, it brings us to that uh, ultimate winner of today's car heat. So I'm just checking my phone now to double check. This is like the golden envelope opening it up at the Oscars. Um, so our winner of uh, Fame Lab 2021, the car heats this year is, drum roll please, Jack Daly. <laughs> Congratulations, Jack. Well done. Oh, thank you so much. There thank we go. You. Jack, uh, a few words. Come on. Yeah, man. Um, look, to come out on top of all the talks tonight, like that's a lot. I mean, that, that's a humble brag myself, like, you know, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but generally, like, I mean, to come out, like, I... I, when I was like, oh, I'm going to get runner-up. And then I didn't get runner-up. I was like, that's it. Get ready for that face. That, uh, oh, congrats to the winner. Like, you know, but um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Like, again, everyone else was just incredible. I, I really didn't think I had it there at all. Like, cheers. Rambling. <laughs> very good, Jack. No, well done. Yeah, no, absolutely. Practicing, you know, the, the polite friends as Joey and friends would do, you know, oh, it's fine. Um, but no, Jack, absolutely brilliant. I, I wholeheartedly agree with the judges there. What a fantastic talk. I think you had a fantastic blend of comedy, science, clarity, charisma, everything. You had the whole the whole package. So well done, Jack. Um, so that brings our evening to a close, everybody. I just want to say yet again, you know, Fantastic. Well done. And so heartening to see such fantastic science communicators coming up through the ranks in Cork City and beyond. Um, fantastic array of science showcase today, again, showcasing the vast variety of careers that are available in science. 
thank you once again to FameLab, uh, to the British Council, to all the sponsors and to all of our partners for joining us tonight. Uh, I know you'll agree what a fantastic evening uh, of science communication. So for, that's all from me, Emer. Uh, over to all of you. Please leave comments in our Facebook feed. We'd love to hear what you thought of this evening and, you know, enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. Yeah.